and the dream is not truly lost in that situation where you wake up and it melts away. And the proof of this, and I'm sure you all have had this experience, is then you go off about your daily business. And then there will be, and it was almost always by coincidence, a, an image, a chance phrase, a, a view of a street or something, and it will cause you to remember the dream. And once you get a hook into a portion of the dream, if you then work on it, you can probably bring a lot of it out. How this works in psychedelics is if I have an insight or something that I particularly want to remember, uh, first of all, I will say it aloud. This is strong imprinting. And then the real imprinting is to repeat it a few minutes later and then a few minutes later again. And if you can carry it over a number of minutes to several different levels, it won't leave you. A, a very useful shortcut for this is a tape recorder where if you play the tape of the trip back after the trip, you will certain just a phrase spoken will set off a chain of associative recall and you will retain it this way. But to my mind, this is um, one of what shamanic training must really be is mnemonic training. The, if you want to bring the stuff back, you have to train yourself to bring it back. Now, this state-bounded thing, it's important to notice. We talk about how dreams are state-bounded how psychedelic experiences are state-bounded, but what we fail to notice usually is that ordinary reality is state-bounded. I mean, if I were to uh, ask any one of you, what did you discuss with the person you had lunch with yesterday? It's probably very touch-and-go to actually put this together. I had lunch yesterday with Richard, we discussed his television transmission system, but that was new to me and therefore easy to retain. And also Richard and I haven't had thousands of hours of conversation together, but uh, the person we are most familiar with is ourselves. Well, it, I don't know if it works for you like this, but I am, let us say, cleaning my house, vacuuming, doing dishes, making beds, and I'm thinking all the time, thinking. And I understand why Rome fell. I realize what I said wrong to somebody two weeks ago. I recall a telephone obligation that I have to fulfill. I think about things that happened years and years ago. And then the doorbell rings and I go to the door and there's someone there and they say, what are you doing? And I say, nothing. This is because the ordinary state of consciousness is highly state-bounded. We don't... One thing these Buddhists have certainly gotten right is that attention to attention is the key to taking control of your mental life. And for most of it, it's just like a river flowing by, you know, and every once in a while we check to see if the river is still flowing by, but we don't uh, attempt to retain it. So uh, memory training is great psychedelic training. And of course, as I'm sure you know, there were arts of memory in the past. We are very poor memorizers because we rely on technologies to do it for us. But uh, people in the past had all kinds of technologies for allowing them to remember things. For instance, uh, the most common one in use in late antiquity and up through the Renaissance was uh, the memory palace approach. This is where you think of a place, a big place preferably, a place you know well, a school, a hospital, a cathedral, a university, but big, and sit and think about it. Think about how it looks as you go through the main doors and then what you see when you turn to the left and what you see when you turn to the right. Learn this building until you really can command it with reasonable vividness in most situations. Then, if you want to remember something, imagine yourself walking through the front door of this building 
turning to your left, and there near the water fountain, you will place an emblem of this thing you want to remember. And then you will go down the hall and around the corner, and by the fire extinguishers, you will place another emblem of the next thing you want to remember. Well, then, the act of remembering this long list of things is the act of mentally moving through this imaginary building that you know. And when you come to the water fountain, the clue will be there. When you pass the fire extinguishers in your mind, the emblem you place there will be there. Now, I know this sounds highly unworkable and unwieldy, but it actually is extremely workable. And, and people like Catullus and Cicero, the great late Roman orators, were able to speak for hours on end uh, with lists of virtues and vices and interconnecting causes and this sort of thing because they were masters of this mnemonic memory palace technique. Well, uh, psychedelics are a vivid... This is another one of these things like mantras, yantras, and so forth that works on psychedelics. You can do this. And so when you're on a psychedelic and you have an experience that you want to remember, place it in your memory palace. And the next time you come past that point in your memory palace, <laughs> this, uh, this thing will be there. Now, the other trick is, any of you who are interested in this, the last word is The Art of Memory by Frances Yates, which is a wonderful woman, great <laughs> scholar of Renaissance magic. And uh, the, the final trick is to make the, mem the image extremely vivid so that, for instance, if you're, if you're about to give a speech to your collegium on uh, the seven deadly sins, well, then one of these sins is lust. I chose the easy one because I can't remember what the other six are. <laughs> Shows you where my problem lies. So you don't... You don't just place the word lust in the memory-keeping spot. You, you place some vivid and shocking image. Yeats suggests the image of a nun lifting her skirts. I think this was a classically suggested one that people were taught to use. Well, then, when you come around the corner and meet the nun lifting her skirts, you think, aha, lust. That's the first, and then you go on and so forth. And books some of the most astonishing products of the medieval engraver's art are these books of what are called emblemata. Emblemata are uh, surreal juxtapositions of things and animal parts and bodies and machines that are memory emblems made as grotesque, surreal, and bizarre as possible in order to make them unforgettable. That, that was the technique. And the surrealists used this very consciously. There is something about the unexpected, the grotesque, and the surprising that is, by, almost by definition, memorable. And this will work very well in the psychedelic state as well. If you ask, you know, just like that thing when you, or your I Love Lucy, when I did a, uh, the Mushroom Experience, and there were certain issues, certain things I went to that ceremony with on my agenda to be healed from. And one of them was to be relieved from some of my early Catholic uh, conditionings that I felt were hanging me up. And when I was in the experience, uh, they talked about the, those niños, the, the little helpers that would come. And I asked, just like Lucy, I said, I need some help. What can you help me with it? I looked at my hand, and the, you know, I could just get something like this. The fucking blood started to come out of my hand, and right in the middle of my hand, the, it, this blood came right out of the palm and started dripping. And I'm like, oh, I'm bleeding. You know, it's like, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> I'm bleeding to death here, and this isn't even... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was like the whole suffering stuff of what Catholics are conditioned with. And the, I mean, it came to me out of the stigmata, and I looked at my other hand, the same thing was happening, and I was going, my God, this is... I'm feeling this 
this crucifixion, you know, thing and the Saint Stephen and my name is Dinah Martin and, and all this martyrdom shit I've subjected. You know, on and on. I mean, you could, you know, I could talk for another 30 minutes about what that, how meaningful that was to me. But I'm, talk about, a, you know, if you want an image, you want a vision, ask the mushroom God, give me a vision. I'll give you one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ask and you'll see. I'm really the uh, the legal aspect of this thing. You know, you're talking something about highly illegal. You know, as far as the law is concerned, how do you handle it? Anybody that drives around with a license plate that says NMDMP, you know, I wonder, you you are you paranoid about it? Obviously not. Um, no, I'm not paranoid about it. Um, if they wanted me, they should have come a long time ago because I was much more vulnerable then. I sort of covered my ass. <laughs> Naturally, if you speak about these things, you can't do anything particularly illegal. And I am, uh, perhaps I'm foolish in the sense that we're not, I shouldn't be worried about being arrested. I should be worried about being shot. Uh, if that's how they play the game, then I'm in big trouble because they'll just come and shoot me, and you too, if you get into this. But if we actually have a legal system that works, then uh, this is called advocacy, and uh, it's not a crime. Uh, it's an exercise of the first, fourth, and, uh, I don't know, a couple of other amendments to the Constitution. Uh, Henry David Thoreau, you don't get more American than that, said that uh, if you are right, you are a majority of one, and we live by majority rule. My, I don't feel heroic. I mean, it's not false modesty or anything. I don't feel heroic doing this. This is really humdrum to me. I just could not behave any other way because of what I've seen. I mean, this transcends laws. All that is, is uh, it's seen as preposterous. I mean, there are, there are, I believe in universal laws. You shouldn't kill people. You shouldn't lie to people. Um, you shouldn't uh, inject yourself between lovers. Uh, most cultures, I think, recognize a set of universal laws. But thou shalt not smoke marijuana? Surely the god of Mount Sinai has better things to do than uh, worry about that sort of thing. We have to create a new option. All social progress is made by people taking chances. Uh, if I am an anomaly, some kind of dangerous sociopath, then my message will be swamped and lost in the noise of the tumult of the world because there are thousands of messages out there. If, on the other hand, this is a great and important domain of truth, then they are crazy to try and repress it because it cannot be repressed. They have tried to repress it. Oh. Why have they tried to repress it? The use of psychoactive drugs is so, uh, you know, good for the psyche. Why have they repressed it? Uh, they thought to repress it because um, there's something in the Western mind that is very nervous, that gets very nervous when you try to talk about... Um, the uh, bedrock of ontology. McLuhan talked about this. He, he met great resistance, and all he was saying was that print had created certain kinds of unconscious biases in society in favor of uniformity, linearity, and uh, like that. And, and he was amazed at the violence of the reaction against this. And he concluded that those cultures that have evolved from the phonetic alphabet are so removed from the stuff of the world as opposed to languages like uh, Chinese or Mayan or something like that where there is a retention of the image in the written language that the cultures descended from the phonetic alphabet are extremely paranoid about questions about the nature of reality. And that's what this is really about. The psychedelic issue does not relate to the drug issue at all. I mean, in fact, it's important to make this point. 
drugs and psychedelics are not two members of a family. They are antithetically opposed to each other. The pro-psychedelic position is an anti-drug position. Now, how can this be since we are accustomed to thinking of psychedelics as drugs? Well, it's like this. What is it that we object to about drugs? And I think everybody can agree maybe not everybody, but most people can agree, we do have a drug problem. I mean, if you live in the inner cities, uh, you see people getting all twisted up behind this stuff. We have a drug problem. So what is it about drugs that we find problematic? Well, I think that what is objectionable about drugs is that they cause uh, unconscious, obsessive, destructive, self or other behavior. Unconscious, obsessive behavior is intolerable because we are conscious people accustomed to injecting choice and meaning into our lives. You cannot have meaning if you do not have choice. This is why we don't have to spend any time at all talking about whether uh, the world is predestined because if the world is predestined, then I'm not saying what I'm saying because it's what I want to say. I'm saying what I'm saying because I can't say anything else. And you're sitting there because you can't not sit there. So it makes the world very dull and uninteresting. Compulsive, unexamined, obsessive behavior is the quintessence of, of anti-human behavior. It was Bertolanffy, the founder of general systems theory, who said... People are not machines. Some of them are drugs which reinforce obsessive be and unexamined and self-destructive behavior patterns. Well, what do psychedelics do? They destroy behavior patterns, destroy cultural assumptions, completely hold everything up for grabs, completely throw open the possibility that reality could be any of a number of ways that are not culturally sanctioned. So, so in that sense, the psychedelics are almost the answer to the drug problem. And the early, the early use of psychedelics reported spectacular progress with alcoholism. Well, now see, the people who believe that alcoholism is a disease and I don't follow this literature closely, it seems to me this is a preposterous statement. I mean, a disease? You mean like influenza and smallpox and AIDS? Alcoholism is a disease? Uh, can you get it if you don't practice safe sex? Or do you have to wash your eating utensils? It isn't a disease. What it is, is it's a uh, failure of self-image. And the reason LSD in many cases had a tremendous impact on alcoholic behavior was because it just showed people what they were doing. It said, this is you. You're a drunk. You're a burden to your family, a bore to your friends. You smell bad and you're useless. How do you like it? <coughs> and so somebody said, I don't like it. I said, well, then stop drinking. That's what it is. That's how psychedelics cure addiction. And uh, nobody, when they talk about addiction, nobody ever talks about what is called self restraint. Terrence, there's a new book that came out about a month or two ago. That's incredibly, con I don't remember the name offhand. Incredibly controversial. Like alcoholism? Yeah, that alcoholism. Heavy drinking. Myth of alcoholism is that's right. Yeah, and it, the man takes the position that the last 30 or 40 years where we've seen alcoholism as a, as a disease is just, you know, more bullshit from the medical model. We need a, another alternative. And of course, AA and everybody's just up in arms about the book. Well, well yeah, AA has... I don't the, remember now. They, they're... What did you think? The, the, the name of the book is... Uh, by, it's by Finnegrad. It's called right. Heavy Drinking, the Myth of Alcoholism as a Disease. Basically, it discusses the fact that uh, it's eventually it's a rationalization to say that it's a disease. I mean, there are certain people, I think, that have some, certain chemical reactions to alcohol, but they're in the minority, and that um, this is very important to me as well because this is work that I'm interested in, and um, alcoholism has also touched my family as it has a lot of families. And yeah, I, I think, think you the, know, it's, the it's disease model yeah. has no, there's no responsibility involved, you know. 
And uh, AA, their position, their goal is not to understand the nature of the universe. They're not in the philosophy business. They're trying to get people to stop drinking. So to maximize that goal, I think that they go far overboard. First of all, all substances, they say, you, if you're an alcoholic, then you must forswear everything. Uh, I don't know how they relate to tobacco. But see, what you've got to understand is we are uh, set up for addiction. It's just like language and cognition and all of these other things. We are the animal which addicts. Other animals don't addict. And addiction is a way of relating to the world. We don't not only addict to drugs, we addict to each other, to chunks of territory, to behavior patterns. Exactly. It's attachment. We attach to everything. Uh, I And it's very real. It's physiological. I remember uh, years and years ago, uh, uh, a woman left me for a homunculus. <laughs> and um, I was uh, appalled. And it, it became... It became uh, it, I mean, I was like vomiting every four hours, could not sleep, would burst into tears in inappropriate situations, of which there were many in my life. And uh, it, 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 heroin withdrawal cannot be worse than that. I mean, are you kidding? Vomiting every four hours? And, uh, and then one night, in the middle of the night, uh, I, I uh, was just frantic because I, I felt like I, when I was awake, I felt like I wanted to be asleep. When I, was a, when I should have been sleeping, I couldn't sleep. And I was just dragging myself to classes. I felt, you know, this is crazy. I should turn myself in. But they don't have crisis centers for broken hearts. What are you going to do? So, so then, in the middle of one of these bouts, I, I went to the medicine cabinet, and this woman who had left me had left all these these pills there. And I sorted through all these pills and came upon a small bottle of tranquilizers, <laughs> a, a, a very mild, mild tranquilizer, like Valium or something. Well, I had never taken a Valium. So I said, I'll take half. And uh, I took it and... Uh, the next morning, or a few hours later, I went out to breakfast and somebody came up and sat at my table and said, well, how are you coping uh, since Hermione left you? And I said, who? <laughs> you know, I just jerk, and, and I, it really gave me respect for tranquilizers. I mean, I was appalled. I was appalled that something so real to me, so... So much me, half the tab, I didn't care, you know, let him go. And then I realized all the people around me, this is how they deal with emotional crisis. Nobody wants to feel anything. I mean, the, first, the moment that an unpleasant emotion rears its head, people go take Valium or, or something else and cut themselves off uh, from feeling. We addict to people. That's the point of that story. And when they leave us suddenly, it's just like having your heroin taken away and you become a mad thing for months, years sometimes. I mean, I still vibrate from this event, and it was 15 years ago. Uh, we addict to territory. This is war, our turf, our land. Now, this arises, again, a consequence of agriculture, before agriculture, nobody had land. It, land was something you walked around on as you migrated behind your herds. Once it was cognized as an object and fixed upon, they were ready to knock the other guy's brains out for setting foot on your territory. We all do this. I mean, we are addicted to caffeine, outrageous caffeine addictions, money, sugar, Praise, television, 
Now, this is the favorite one to talk about because television is a forerunner of very insidious drugs to come. It's just the crudest and the first. Uh, but imagine if after World War II, a drug had been introduced into this country of right-thinking, hard-working, decent Christian people such that 20 years after its induction, the average American citizen would be spending six and a half hours per day involved in this drug. That's the figure for television consumption in this country. The average American watches six and a half hours a day of TV. It is an electronic drug. It is an obsessive behavior pattern, an unconscious behavior pattern, and a physically destructive behavior pattern. I mean, it's done more for the rebirth of uh, hemorrhoid specialists than any other single force in our society. So, uh, but people say, well, that's not a drug, that's entertainment. Six and a half hours a day of entertainment? You know, before electronic media, a person could regard themselves as a great patron of, uh, let's say, the musical community, and maybe they would hear 12 live musical performances a year when they would go to a theater. I mean, how many, how many people in Beethoven, how many experts on Beethoven in his generation or the generation following heard let's say, the Ninth Symphony more than several times in their intellectual life. Because, you know, you have to get a lot of people together and cooperating to perform the Ninth Symphony. We, to us, the Ninth Symphony is an object. Listen to it. Listen again. Listen again. We are able to turn experience, we are able to objectify experience and then addict ourselves to it. Well, is this bad? How can it be bad if it is so written into us? Uh, I don't think it is bad. I think what we have to do is choose our addictions, choose our behavior patterns. I mean, one can choose to be addicted to punctuality. I'm accused of this. Other people are addicted to always being late. One can be addicted to... Um, you know, meaningless sexual encounters. You mean uh, because of the physiological angle? Well, I think that's been much overplayed. I think, uh, I mean, should we not fall in love because we pheromonally lock together with this person and become a single unified set of drives and uh, goals. Uh, the physiological aspects of addiction have been, I think, uh, very strongly overdrawn. I, I smoke cannabis every day at most opportunities and have for years and years, I mean, since I was 18 years old, every once in a while I stop just to see what that's like. It's trivial. It's utterly easy. All that happens is a shift in behavior patterns. I read more. That's what happens when I stop smoking uh, cannabis. And yet I'm supposed to be breaking out into cold sweats, wandering aimlessly through the streets of the city, staring up at lighted windows. Uh, yeah, right. So I think we give each other too much permission to be weak in this area. What is never talked about in talk about addiction is self-restraint. I mean, for heaven's sake, you know, just take hold of yourself. Responsibility. Yeah, responsibility. And if you tell people addiction is a disease, addiction is it's because you're black, it's because you're poor, it's because you're this, it's because you're that, you have just given them a whole bunch of reasons not to take responsibility for their own situation. And what is needed in these addictive situations, I think, is the shock of recognition. Uh, I believe, see, that if you don't take drugs, you're unbearable. 
and there's no, I can't think of a society on earth where people don't take drugs that any of us would want to have anything to do with. I mean, let's take Calvinist Geneva, say. I imagine that as an example of a fairly, of an environment of moral rectitude. I mean, these people uh, did not wear bright colors, didn't listen to music, never drank coffee, never smoked, forget about alcohol, sex for procreation, so forth and so on. And they were our paradigms of uh, the male ego frozen in, in place, didactic, paternalistic, uh, uh, all-knowing, uh, uh, filled with hellfire and damnation. Everything is seen in terms of a moral dimension that makes impossible demands on the human animal. Uh, rather, I think what we should realize is that somehow our evolution into a civilized, self-reflecting being is caught up in these synergistic relationships that our conscious mind has with various things in the environment so that we should choose our addictions. Now notice that addictions, uh, to my mind, and you know, you can argue with this if you want by choosing extreme examples, but addictions to natural substances are harmless. Let me name some natural substances that you might disagree with me on this point. I think probably the, the strongest one would be people would say, well, what about opium? Surely this is the scourge of mankind. Actually, opium was never a problem in human populations until it was conceived of as a problem by British colonial pol policy makers who decided that they could manipulate the opium trade to get an entree into China. Uh, um, alcohol was never a problem, particularly, until the discovery of distilled alcohol. Uh, and, of course, heroin is distilled opium, morphine also. Um, sugar is a refined vegetable substance. It's every, in every case, it has required the intercession of science and technology to take harmless habits and turn them into dangerous addictions so that, uh, you know, everybody has a solution to the drug problem. I think what I would suggest is something called the Vegetable Drug Act, where you just say, if it's a vegetable, it's not a drug. This is, was the position until very recently in, with British common law. In Canada, mushrooms were legal. Mushrooms aren't psilocybin. Psilocybin is a refined chemical. Uh, if it is technology which allows us then to create these super powerful addicting substances, and there will be more and more of them downstream, you may be sure. So I think what we need to do is think of human beings as hardware, as the, the computer, if you will, and drugs are forms of software. And the software that you run determines the kind of functions that you can perform. If you, if you run uh, distilled alcohol software, well then you take on the persona of the alcoholic. Uh, I believe that cannabis is probably the most harmless and benign uh, drug around. It, it carries out this feminizing that I talked about. It lowers the profile of the male ego. Instead of wanting to duke it out, people just say, well, if that's your thing, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> And uh, that's what we need, you know. I mean, that practically boils down to what we call tolerance. Uh, so I think that uh, this disruption of our relationships to, um, to psychoactive plants is what set us on the long, hard, downward path into neurosis. And it began with agriculture with the narrowing of our spectrum of plant awareness from many, many plants 
down to uh, the rye, the oats, the barley. And it's interesting that then out of this came uh, the cultivation of, uh, I mean, I think beer preceded wine. Beer is an older thing than wine. That comes out of the fact of having created surpluses because the way the way beer was discovered was through the fermentation of grain that was stored. If you didn't have surpluses, you would never discover the psychoactive properties of fermented grain. It's very interesting. In Nepal, the, um, the uh, Newari people have an alcoholic beverage that when it's put in front of you, it looks like a bowl of granola. It's dry. They pour it out of a sack into your cup, and you say, you know, this is beer? And then they come along with boiling water and pour it over it, and then you get this foamy, lightly fermented, contaminated grain water. And to my mind, that clearly is then how fermentation of grains and production of alcohol was established. Notice that it was also the accumulation of surplus from the agricultural adaptation that creates the need for defense because now you've got a surplus. Now you have to guard your surplus from everybody who doesn't have any. The other thing that creation of surpluses caused was... uh, the invention of uh, barter and money and this sort of thing because now you have something that you can trade for something that you don't have. So all of these adaptations also, a nomadic people cannot move a grain surplus with them. So if you're harvest one year, if you're a semi-nomadic people, that's a people who, like in the Amazon, they plant things and then they leave them and go away, and they have like a yearly peregrination. And when they come back to that place a year later, there's all this food ready for them. Well, imagine a nomadic people who were uh, doing that kind of quasi-agriculture with cereal, and then there's one year of great weather and great rainfall, and when they arrive at their little wheat patch, so much wheat has been produced that they can't move it. They can't take it with them. So then they say, well, we in, we, but we have food now, so we don't have to keep hunting, so let's spend the winter here. And this interruption of the cycle of nomadism to deal with unexpected surpluses obviously spawned the idea in people's minds, well, wouldn't it be great if we had surpluses every year? And then that says, well, that won't happen if we're as careless as we have been about our sowing and harvesting. But maybe if we're very careful and till the land and carefully plant and do careful weeding, we'll have to stay here and weed, but then we'll get this tremendous payback in the end. So uh, to my mind, the invention of agriculture broke our relationship to Uh, the wild plants and the lowered profile of the male ego and set us on a path of defending wealth, creating fortifications, uh, supporting more specialization, larger populations, so forth and so on. And from there to the present predicament, it's only a moment. Pardon me? from that too, uh, such, you know, the fear of losing your wealth, uh, 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 then fighting to protect it. And That's right. Also and also, this idea of our land, because you want to hang on to this good cereal growing land, so it's yours, you say, and then you put a wall around it, and then you defend it, and so forth and so on. Well, uh, yeah. What do, you, what do you see the door? What do you see the door? The great nature and the position that we've got ourselves and we see it in the well, I think that we're now, things are very far out of hand and we're caught up now in the end game of history. And 
that we are going to uh, have to create a way out of this impasse that is probably going to mean a complete definite redefining of who we are and how we rate, relate to each other and space and time and life and death. And it appears that technology is now the thing that is guiding us forward. We are not being led into the future by politicians. Politicians are running frantically along behind the wagon of history, trying to jump onto it. What is leading us, what's pulling the cart is technology. And I think technology is the program of realizing the practical concerns of the imagination. And that really where we are headed is the imagination. It's a place. It, I don't know whether it's in solid state circuitry or in the bones of the planet or in artificial arcologies in deep space. The future will figure out the details, but we are close enough to it now that we can anticipate it. It's what the shamans always said was possible, a world of value and meaning uh, lived in the light of nature. And I think if we can get through this narrow neck that rationalism has imposed upon us and overcome these poisonous uh, paternalistic uh, philosophies, we will return. That's why I call it the archaic revival. It's the myth of the eternal return. History is something that you finish with as quickly as possible and then return to the archaic mode of eternity. And uh, I think that's the adventure that we're all caught up in. That's the agenda that the plants and the planet have always had in front of them. It's just that we wandered away from an awareness of what was happening by deluding ourselves with our own uh, inflated self-image. You know, uh, man as master of woman and nature. And this distorted part of our self-image has now become so dangerous to us that we have to abandon it. We have to draw back from it. And under that kind of pressure, I think we will. So, harking back to another question, the reason I do this and the reason I don't feel any great trepidation about it is because I believe that uh, historical momentum is with us. This is what is destined to come to be. We are going to take control of who we are by taking control of the physiological and psychological foundations upon which the self rests. And that means the chemical re-engineering of ourselves into the state of Edenic innocence that was lost when we set out on the long trail of uh, of, uh, you know, the sword and the hoe, basically.